name is Mustafa Abidnifard. Uh, I'm a faculty in the Department of Asian Studies at the University of British Columbia. And uh, today we're having another uh, one of the winter, uh, uh, spring and winter 22, uh, 2022 uh, lectures in the Ali Reza Ahmadiyan lectures in Iranian and Persian Asian Studies. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we are um, honored to have uh, two guests today. But before um, anything, I would like to acknowledge that uh, while we are gathering virtually and uh, through the Zoom platform, uh, UBC Vancouver is situated on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Salalwatuth peoples. Um, as uh, you have probably seen the poster, the title of today's talk is Mola Nasruddin of Teflis and the transnational diasporic milieu that gave birth to it uh, during 1906 to 1931. Um, our speaker is Dr. Janet Afari, uh, professor and Melicham chair in Glo global religion uh, from University of California at, in Santa, Santa Barbara. And our discussant is Dr. Hassan Javadi, uh, retired academic from University of California uh, in Berkeley. Before I uh, introduce our uh, speaker and discussant in more detail, I would like to mention just a few um, things that I normally do at the beginning. Uh, I would like, first of all, to thank uh, my uh, dear team members, uh, Connie, on um, our closed captioning uh, volunteer, Nazgul Tabakulizadeh, and also Dr. Farzana Kermani for uh, his wonderful poster designs. I would also like to ask that if you have any questions, uh, um, if any questions occur to you throughout the presentation, uh, please do type them uh, in the Q&A box. And of course, after the presentation, there will be time uh, and the discussion, there will be time for uh, Q&A as well. And finally, um, again, as I mentioned, uh, uh, our colleague Naz Gulatavakulizadeh is kindly helping us with providing um, on time, uh, closed captioning. Uh, if you or anyone around you would like to access uh, this feature, uh, you might want to uh, turn on the live transcript at the bottom of the Zoom toolbar and then click show subtitles. Uh, that's how you can actually activate this. At this point, um, it's my honor to uh, introduce our speaker and discuss him. Today's presenter, uh, Janet Afari uh, holds the Meli Champ uh, Chair in Global Religion and Modernity um, at the University of California, Santa Barbara, where she is a professor of religious studies. She's a historian of modern Iran and has a PhD in history and Near East studies from the University of Michigan, where her dissertation received the Distinguished Rackham Dissertation Award. Previously, she taught at the Department of History and the Program in Women's Studies at Purdue University, where she was appointed a university faculty scholar. Um, I remember I mentioned something when introducing one of our uh, guests uh, last week that uh, um, these uh, bios, basically, they are sent to us by the speakers and discussant themselves, and I can also attest that both this and the one for Dr. Javadi, both of them are humbly shortened. Uh, Dr. Afari uh, has a lot of contributions uh, you know, to Iranian, uh, Middle Eastern studies, uh, and uh, in many fields, uh, including especially in gender and sexuality studies. Um, today's discussant, Hassan Javadi, was born in Tabriz, Iran, to a distinguished family of administrators and scholars. He has taught English and Persian literature at the University of Cambridge, Tehran University, and the University of California at Berkeley. He's the author and translator of numerous books. Now retired, Dr. Javadi lives in the Washington DC area where he is working on original scholarship and translations of Persian literature. Thank you uh, very much, uh, both Dr. Afari and Dr. Javadi for joining us. At this point, I would like to ask um, everyone to please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Afari for um, her uh, presentation. We cannot wait to hear that. Thank you very much, Dr. Abedini Farah. I appreciate your kind invitation. 
Thanks, My Connie pleasure. and Nazgul, for organizing today. And I'm really thrilled to have Dr. Javadi here. He has been a mentor, true mentor to me, a truly, truly dedicated a scholar, a historian, uh, someone with an encyclopedic knowledge, really, of the field. And he's just been so immensely generous always with his time. So it's, it's really a great pleasure to have you here. Um, I'll be speaking on, if, if I may share screen here with you. Um, I'll be uh, speaking on uh, the periodical Mullah Nasruddin, uh, which is the subject of a book that uh, we're publishing in August of this year. So, uh, all right. Now, um, the reinterpretation of myths and folklores has been an essential genre in literature uh, from the ancient Greek world to our contemporary societies, we're familiar with writers such as Maxine Hong Kingston or Toni Morrison, who've interpreted old tales to forge new social criticisms. Our forthcoming book, Molan Nasruddin, The Making of a Modern Trickster, um, which is going to be published by Edinburgh University Press in August of this year, is a historical exploration of such a genre among Azerbaijani speaking people of South Caucasus. This is a map of the region. At, uh, it's a map of the Safavid Empire before 1722. But if you look at the map, particularly if you look at the northern part here, which it says Aran, this is the area we're talking about, this region, which used to be part of Iran during the Safavid Empire. And then during the wars uh, at the beginning of the 19th century with Russia, were lost to the Russian Empire. They became part of the Russian Empire. And today, of course, they um, encompass the countries of um, Azerbaijan, um, uh, the Republic of Georgia, the Republic of Armenia, and also the southern part of uh, Russia, uh, Dag the Dagestan area. Uh, Okay, well, we're talking about Russian colonialism, quite appropriate at a time when Russia is trying to colonize another country. Russian colonialism differed from its British and French counterparts in important ways. Um, uh, the Muslims of South Caucasus, the Jews and other non-Christians were all considered third class citizens. The first class citizens were Russian Orthodox Christians. The second class ones were Catholic and Protestant denominations. Um, and the Tsar state settled on a policy of religious toleration towards minority communities, which remained, agreed to become subservient to the Russian state. So there was no such tolerance, for example, for the Chechens, primarily Sunnis. But for the Shim populations, for example, uh, who had acquiesced to a colonial domination, essentially, um, they had a policy of religious toleration rather than forcing them into religious conversion or expulsion. The administrative offices worked closely with Muslim clerics to implement the Sharia law. And in the process, they had created a sort of an Islamic church for the Shia Azerbaijanis that historically did not have a centralized doctrinal authority. It was the same way as in Iran with multiple mushtahids, for example, before this period. Now, under Russian colonialism, minorities were subject to numerous restrictions and religious tests for any high position. This cartoon from the British journal Punch, it's about 1891, I believe. It's, um, it shows the position of a Jew in Russia, but the same would have been similar thing for uh, the Muslim population, the Shia Muslim population. They could not, for example, serve on most locally elected councils. They faced restrictions on the sale of their property, could not be shareholders in a corporation. And generally in any legal dispute between a Christian, a Muslim and a Jew, the Christian of course would be favored by the courts. The Russians did see the Muslim population as exotic, backward, uncivilized and even dangerous as people who needed to be disciplined and educated by the state. So we can use terms like colonialist or orientalist to refer to the conduct of the czarist authorities. 
But the Muslims were not powerless subjects and subalterns in the way that we use it for India, for example, in the 18, early 19th century. By 1905, there were a number of extremely wealthy cosmopolitan Shi Muslim industrialists in Baku who wholeheartedly supported the religious and educational reform movements of the region. This is a picture of Ajiz Taqiyov, one of the most important ones and a really major philanthropist. Muslim Azerbaijani uh, communities established their own newspapers and journals, theaters. They had a strong group of playwrights, multiple charitable societies. They had their own private schools for girls, as well as many modern institutions. This cultural renaissance of Muslim South Caucasus was, I'm insisting, an indigenous movement and by no means a colonial enterprise. Indeed, the Tsarist regime was re reluctant to support efforts at religious reform, especially the education of Muslim girls, because it feared the backlash by the Muslim clerics with which it worked very closely. So unlike, for example, India under British colonialism, Muslims of South Caucasus under Tsarist <clears throat> colonialism exercised much agencies. The intellectuals of this community selected what they perceived to be the best aspects of their Shi Iranian Azerbaijani culture, blended it with the educational, literary, and artistic cultural productions of Europe and Russian societies, in order to create a truly indigenous, modern Muslim Azerbaijani culture. And they did so before the 1917 Russian Revolution and the establishment of the Soviet Union, as our story will hopefully demonstrate. Now, who were the principal contributors of Mullah Nasruddin? In 1906, a group of artists and intellectuals reinterpreted the tales of the Middle Eastern trickster Mullah Nasruddin to construct a progressive anti-colonial discourse with a strong emphasis on social, political, and religious reforms. The founder and editor we see in this picture was Jalil Mehmet Golizadeh, commonly known as Mirza Jalil, who was an Azerbaijani educator and playwright. His wife, Hamida Khanum Javan Shir, was an early Azerbaijani feminist and a philanthropist. Some of the other gifted contributors and staff members were Ali Akbar Tahirzadeh Behzad, a brilliant poet who revolutionized Azerbaijani literature, Abdul, Kari, Abdul Rahim Bey Hekzardiyov, a playwright and stage director, as well as a member of the first state Duma of the Russian Empire, Muhammad Saeed Urdubadi, who was a prolific correspondent and writer, and covered the revolutionary in Iran, the revolutionary events in Iran during the Tabriz civil war. And the principal artists were first Oskar Schmerling and Yusef Rotter, and then later Azim Azimzadeh, who together are considered co-founders of the art of caricature in South Caucasus. Mullah Nasruddin exceeded the accomplishments of each of these individuals individually leading to the creation of a satirical school of thought in Azerbaijani literature using folklore, visual art, and satire, their eight to 10 page weekly, which had full page color lithographs, lithographic cartoons, reached tens of thousands of people across the Muslim world, impacting the thinking of a generation. The most creative period of Mullah Nasruddin were the years 1906 to 12, when a highly talented group of artists, writers, and poets were staff members. And so this is with regard to the Iranian experience of the Iranian revolution. Um, this is the Sayyid Tabo Taboi, who was one of the major constitutionists. He's introduced as Tabib Hazek Mashute. And then the newspapers, Abdul Matin, Ershad, Ejtahad, and Mola Nasruddin, trying to revive the ailing Iran. The key to this successful cultural melange of the periodical was the creative, creative use of a trickster figure as a medium of social criticism. The traditional wise fool, the trope of the folk character Nasruddin, broke conventional boundaries of thought and morality, revealed the hypocrisy of the existing social reality, 
ridiculed the overbearing theologian, the conceited scholar, the indolent aristocrat, and the autocratic king. Using the tropes of the folk Nasruddin, the periodical Mullah Nasruddin also brought down to earth and debased powerful contemporary figures, creating space for new ways of thinking about relations of power in society. Now, it was an important time in the Caucasus. The 1880s oil boom in Baku and the spurt of industrialization in certain parts of the Russian Caucasus brought European and American investors. It also brought migrant workers from Iran and the Ottoman Empire to the region, leading to significant economic growth. As more wealth was generated, economic inequities of the region widened, particularly in the city of Baku. New political parties were formed to address the new situation. Among them were various social democratic organizations affiliated with the Russian Social Democratic Workers Party, both the Bolshevik and the Menshevik wings of it. And remember, we're talking about, uh, about at least over, over a decade before the Russian Revolution of 1917. Now, Tiflis was a cosmopolitan city. It's where Mullah Nasruddin was published. It was the administrative and cultural capital of Tsarist Russia's southwestern peripheries and a magnet for artists. The majority of its residents were Armenians with large numbers of Georgians and Russians. But the city also had a small Shia Muslim population, both long-term Caucasus Azerbaijanis and migrant workers from Iran. It was a vibrant center of politics, an eclectic cosmopolitan city where artists, playwrights, and journalists of multiple diasporic communities interacted and added to the city's cultural diversity. Mullah Nasruddin soon captured the imagination of a wide sector of the Muslim world, as you can see from this cartoon in the pages of the journal itself. Historians of South Caucasus and Iran have called the birth of the journal a historic moment in the annals of the region. In the first year of its publication, Mullah Nasruddin had a circulation of 25,000, of which 15,000 readers were inside Iran. So that's a huge number. Over 13,000 were subscribers inside Iran. So there were more people reading it inside Iran than they were reading it actually in the Caucasus. With its wide circulation, it reached a wide audience in the coffee shops and bazaars of South Caucasus in Iran, the Ottoman Empire, and as far away as Egypt and India. It was read aloud in these spaces to diverse groups, including many illiterate urban workers and rural peasants. So the impact was far more than the 25,000 circulation, which I have for the first year, but I don't know, it might have even been more later on. The periodical faced immediate and implacable opposition. South Caucasus and Iranian clerics issued fatwas against the journal. Still, it was smuggled across the border into Iran and other countries. Mirza Jali's younger brother and other staff members crossed the border to Iran multiple times. They distributed the periodical in Tabriz during the Tabriz civil war and in the trenches. They also had what we call today embedded reporters who covered the constitutional revolution and the Tabriz resistance from the ground. And that's how these reports in satirical form appeared in the periodical. <coughs> Mullah Nasruddin called for <clears throat> freedom, justice, and constitutionalism. As you can see in the graphic on the left, um, the women are holding signs that says Horriyat Qanun Asasi and Idola. Many writers of Mullah Nasruddin worked with the Social Democratic Himmat Party. They were committed to its platform of fighting for social reform and against political despotism and religious orthodoxy. They promoted secular education, marital reforms, and greater rights for women and children, brought attention to the poverty of workers and peasants, and criticized many sacrosanct Shi rituals, such as the practice of self-flagellation, Sinazani, 
during the festival of Muharram. So this one is calls it an Iranian army at the bottom, which is an army of flagellants compared to a Russian army in the north. <clears throat> However, the journal was not anti-religious. Uh, rather, it was the first publication in the Shia Muslim world to unapologetically reinterpret Quranic verses in light of modern social norms, including girls' education and greater reforms in marriage and divorce laws. The artists of the periodical played a critical role. They mingled modernist and social democratic artistic influences with old humanistic traditions of classical Persian poetry, creating a new cultural and artistic discourse. You have the modern traditions of graphic arts, as you can see in this image, critiques of Shi rituals of penance, as you can see in the previous ones, and Azerbaijani poetry in the pages of the journal. Their goal was to highlight the violence and hypocrisy of the European powers and to critique also indigenous social and cultural practices. This is uh, European politics, um, basically uh, encouraging the mighty bull of, of the, the Muslim world basically into a death where the Europeans are waiting down below uh, to cut it up actually. The graphics and cartoons of Mullah Nasruddin belong to a tradition of satirical art that stretches back to the 18th and 19th century European lithographic art they were especially influenced by the Spanish artist Francisco Jose de Goya and the French artist Honore Domier. But also they, they also drew upon newer forms of caricature in British, German, and Russian satirical publications and the critical realist school of art in Tiflis and St. Petersburg. Now, success has many claimants. The Azerbaijani Republic rightfully recognizes the periodical as a founding contributor to modern Azerbaijani nationalism and a classic literary work. Iranian historians, though, have also claimed the periodical as one of their own, since many members of the editorial board belong to immigrant Iranian families. Also, there was a large volume of articles and graphics about Iran in the paper. The Georgian Republic also can have a claim to Mullah Nasruddin as it was published in Tiflis. And what made the journal a sensation was its cartoons, primarily drawn by its two Georgian German artists, Schmerling and Rotel. In reality, Mullah Nasruddin belonged to a transnational diasporic society before modern, modern lines of modern nation states were drawn. In this region, Russians, Caucasus, Azerbaijanis, Georgians, Germans, Armenians, Iranians, Jews, and other ethnicities of a variety of religious, cultural, and political persuasions mingled on a daily basis and shared the common territory. Indeed, I would argue that the theme of diaspora, of living in transition between cultures and of crossing borders is a very prominent one in Mullah Nasruddin. There are multiple cartoons such as this one referring to the crossing of the Aras River, which was the boundary between the Caucasus and Iran. As a transnational publication, Mullah Nasruddin never limited itself to the local concerns of the Azerbaijani Muslims of South Caucasus. Rather, from the beginning, Mullah Nasruddin saw itself as a mouthpiece for other persecuted Muslim populations and even other colonized people around the world. This one is called the Carving of Fez. Uh, and it's about the Europeans carving out what we call today modern Morocco. Uh, as the Ottoman Sultan Abdul Hamid is sort of standing by and watching, and there's some dancing going on there by the Iranians and by other people of what we would call today third world. The editor and several writers of the periodical grew up in Azerbaijani speaking Shi communities of Caucasus with strong affinities to Iran. Mirza Jalil, for example, was born in Nakhchavan. His grandparents migrated from Iran to the Caucasus, and the family heavily identified with the Iranian culture. Various contributors to Mullah Nasruddin visited Iran, went there to start new businesses, or occasionally fled to Iran from Russian persecution. Therefore, we may think of a journal as a transnational diasporic periodical in Azerbaijani language, 
that was heavily influenced by Iranian culture and social practices. The hybrid identities of the contributors to Mullah Nasreddin have been of great interest to Iranian Azerbaijani scholars, among them Rahim Rezozadeh Malik, Rahim Rais Nia, Samak de Sargari Nia, and our own Hassan Javadi, and with more recently with Willem Flor, who translated the memoirs of Hamid Khanum into English, and it's available on Amazon. All of these writers and translators and authors have emphasized the great continuity between the Iranian Azerbaijani and Caucasus Azerbaijani cultures. Like many other diaspora communities, the writers of Mullah Nasreddin felt torn between their close religious, cultural, and ethnic bonds to Iran, their desire to assert their Azerbaijani language and cultural heritage, their need to further assimilate within the greater Russian society in order to succeed professionally. This feeling of in-betweenness, of wanting so deeply and passionately to belong to one place <coughs> or another, and yet finding that there really was no one place where one could find oneself at home, vividly comes through in many columns and poems. In this one, the Azerbaijani Turk, it says, I have my tongue, gentlemen, and it shows an Arab and a Persian and a Turk forcing him is, you know, the style of Turkish, of Ottoman Turkey, forcing him to speak, um, and Russian, forcing him to speak multiple other languages, but not his own language. Uh, Mullah Nasruddin, <coughs> in its initial most creative six years, <coughs> excuse me, wrote about four major political events, the Russian Revolution of 1905-06, which led to constitutional reforms and a free press in Russia, but was tragically ended. The Armenian Muslim Wars of 1905-07, which saw the devastation of hundreds of Armenian and Azerbaijani villages. The Iranian Constitutional Revolution of 1906-11, which brought a parliament and a constitution to Iran for the first time before being defeated by invading Russian forces, and the Young Turk Revolution of 1908, which restored the Ottoman constitution and brought about a multi-party regime. All of these historic events were discussed and analyzed in the pages of the journal. This one is actually quite remarkable because this cartoon of the potential attack of the, the reactionaries led by Sheikh Fazlullah Nuri, as you can see, is sitting on the top of Satan, was actually published in September of 1907. So it's actually four months before this actual coup, uh, you know, first coup, which, which is not successful. This first coup happens um, on the Majlis and you know, the, the presence of the journal is quite remarkable in actually anticipating that. Now, uh, recent cultural and diasporic studies have explored migrants from India, China, Africa, the Middle East, who settled in the more industrialized metropolitan cities of Europe and the United States, or in post-colonial Caribbean societies, and formed several generations of diasporic societies marked by constant dualities. These migrants no longer anticipated the day when they would go back to home and resume their quote-unquote normal lives but neither were they fully integrated into the new place. Such diaspora communities abandoned much of their old culture without assimilating into the new one. Cultural theorists Hamid Nafisi and Stuart Hall and others have argued that a diaspora community is often suspended in midair between places and faces a daily clash of cultures, which it constantly has to negotiate. The collision of cultures, including religious precepts, and the contestations of traditional modes of thought and also of modernity can have two results. It could generate a defensively intolerant reaction to the culture of the new homeland, with which of course we're quite familiar these days with the various forms of fundamentalism in the 21st century, or it could lead to refreshingly innovative, complex, and progressive perspectives and practices 
a form of cross-fertilization that does not fully replicate the binary of old homeland and new homeland, east and west. And this we're suggesting is what happened in the case of Mullah Nasruddin. The transnational um, scholar, Janine Dahinden, has shown the diversity that, that can exist within a particular diasporic community and its relationship to the home of its origin. The four possible relationships within their community of origin, the sending country, and their new homeland, the receiving country. And by the way, we see this also sometimes when the border just moves. So for example, in the case we're talking about, it's not that people were actually moving necessarily. I mean, there were diaspora people who moved from Iran, but there were also people who were in the Caucasus, the border had moved and they were not part of the Russian empire. Another example of that would be of course in California where I live, uh, where, the, where California used to be part of Mexico and then it became part of the United States, but it's a very similar dynamic between um, you know, Mexican Americans and uh, the old homeland of Mexico. So there could be diasporic transnationals. These are long-term migrants with deep anchorage in the receiving country. These are people who live a middle-class life. Their children speak the language of the new country fluently. The ties that they have to their home con sending country manifest themselves in cultural efforts like establishing bilingual education for children, charities or benevolent associations as well as journalistic, literary, and artistic and academic activities. <clears throat> then you have the mobile or exilic transnationals. These are first-generation immigrants who still have strong familiar ties to the receiving country and might go back and forth from time to time. Then there's seasonal workers with visas who go back and forth annually. And finally, there are asylum seekers and undocumented migrants who are unable to sink roots in either country. These are not hard and fast categories. A person might move from one category to the another uh, in the course of their lives. So what about the people who were on the editorial board of Mullah Nasruddin? A few of them were from families that were native to the Caucasus. So for example, Hamid Khanum belonged to a native Caucasus Azerbaijani family that had ruled Karabakh Khanat. That territory was incorporated into the Russian empire in the early 19th century, but the family maintained its distant ties with some relatives in Iran, <clears throat> as we read in Hamid Khanum's memoir. Most Mullah Nasruddin contributors belong to the first and second categories. That is, they were diaspora transnationals and mobile transnationals. Mirza Jali's grandfather had emigrated from Iranian Azerbaijan making Mirza Jalil a third generation immigrant, quite well versed in the Russian language and culture. He actually never had been to Iran until 1920 when he was forced to do so. Some members of Mullah Nasruddin's editorial board, such as the poet Sauber, had been mobile transnationals at one point in their lives. Sauber was born in Shamohi in South Caucasus he traveled to Iran frequently and for a while worked in the eastern city of Eshkabad in Khorasan before returning to Tiflis. Mirza Jalil's younger brother, Mirza Ali Akbar, was also a mobile transnational. He lived in Iran for several years and even took part in the constitutional revolution. He became close friends with Sattar Khan, the national hero of the Chapri civil war. And in 1909, he was arrested and exiled by the Russian authorities for his political activities in Iran. These ties to Iran became useful after the Russian Revolution of 1917. During the Russian Civil War of 1918 to 21, Mirza Jalil and Hamid Khanom and their family sought refuge in Tabriz. They came to Tabriz for a year. They stayed there for about a year, but they might have stayed permanently if the radical nature of their journal had not rattled the Persian-centric and socially conservative local government of Iranian Azerbaijan. The Tabriz authorities, for example, asked Mirza Jalil to publish Mullah Nasruddin in Persian, something which he refused to do. Likewise, Hamid Khanum, who had never worn the veil, was pressured to wear the veil, which she also refused. These factors, plus their deep ties to South Caucasus, were important in their decision to return. 
So in 1921, when the new Bolshevik government of Azerbaijan invited them to return and resume publication at state expense, they decided to do so. <clears throat> Now, not all transnationals had connections to Iran. The associate editor, Omar Faer, had relatives in Turkey where he had studied for several years. He might have stayed, he was also Sunni, by the way. He might have stayed if the Ottoman police had not chased him out for his political activities with Ottoman constitutionalists. And the artist, Oskar Schmerling, uh, for example, who grew up in Tiflis, belonged to a migrant German community which had settled in Tiflis decades earlier. He went back in the same way that, for example, uh, some of the um, uh, uh, Azerbaijani ones went back to Iran. He went back to Munich to study for a few years. Uh, this is something that many members of the Protestant Georgian German community did. The other one was Jos Yusef Rotter. He signs his name as Joseph, but in private he's, he's Yusef. He was a German Jew. He's a more recent immigrant to Tbilisi from Germany. And he returned to Germany when World War I started in 1914. The Iranian migrant workers of Teflis, Baku, Yerevan, and other cities who were discussed in the pages of Mullah Nasruddin mostly belong to the categories of seasonal or undocumented workers. So the journal's preoccupation with migrant Iranian workers, as you can see in this cartoon, stem from the writer's real or imagined ties to the Iranian Azerbaijani homeland in an attempt to maintain some of their ethnic, national, or religious boundaries over generations. Often it was not due to intimate familiar or communal ties, the tendency to address the needs of seasonal workers most probably stemmed from their political leanings, particularly their loose commitment to social democracy and the desire to ameliorate the lives of marginalized migrants of their community. <clears throat> now, one of the questions that preoccupied me when I started working on this project was how to analyze the graphics of the journal. Uh, <clears throat> what I realized was that German, Polish, and ethnic Russian artists came to Tiflis and played an important role in the artistic renaissance of Tiflis. They taught painting, drawing, sculpture, and architecture at Tiflis's art schools. Local artists of Tif Tiflis were also inspired by European artistic conventions while they were creating their own art. So gradually we see a triangular relationship developing here. Students start maybe at the Tiflis Fine Arts Society. Then if they're good, they continue their education at the St. Petersburg Academy of Arts. Then if they're better and proficient, they go to the Munich Academy of Arts, which is what you see here in this picture to complete their education. So both Schmerling and Rote were both trained at the Munich Academy of the Arts. They were also influenced by the Wanderer, a radical Russian school of art, as well as various left of center progressive movements. Following these new ways of thinking, they broke with the colonial artistic mindset and became pioneers of critical realism in Tiflis. Their work began to show a greater affinity for a wide variety of cultures and people. This is a work by Schmerling at the Tiflis Art Museum before he became <clears throat> an artist for Mullah Nasruddin. The artists of Mullah Nasruddin belonged to this generation of artists. They were critical of colonial Russian and European domination, but they were also inspired by the European artistic heritage. At the same time, they remained attuned to the sensibilities of their South Caucasus and Central Asian societies. Now, European conventions of caricature are actually quite problematic because they're based on many racist, sexist, and orientalist views of the East and involve the pseudoscience of physiognomy. This is when you melt human and animal features in discussing the characteristics of, for example, different nations, as you can see from here. So this is a cartoon, <clears throat> 1882, after Britain conquers Egypt after the Urabi revolt. 
And you could see Britain, of course, is the mighty lion standing on its just chair, which is the crocodile, which is Egypt, crocodile being, of course, um, crocodile supposedly in, uh, in uh, the river, the Nile River of Egypt. And then you have Russia in the background and you have quivering animals waiting for the lion to finish uh, with the crocodile. And then so maybe they'll have a share of it at the end. And this is from the punch, the British punch. So in, uh, the, the uh, artist of Mola, this is another uh, artist, for example, another work from Punch also. It's the idea is that one's appearance determines one's character. Those who are endowed with European definitions of beauty are seen as inherently ethical and moral and people with physical deformities or even what's considered unattractive features by Western standards are seen as morally corrupt. Satirical and illustrated European journalists including Punch, used elements of physiognomy to suggest that there was a racial hierarchy among nations and people. So here, this is Sultan Abdul Hamid, totally dropped out, oblivious to the future of his nation, uh, while the European leaders are talking about the future of the Ottoman Empire and partition of the Ottoman Empire. <laughs> Now, Mullah Nasruddin also used physiognomy, as you can see from this cartoon, but the application of physiognomy was along ideological rather than racial lines. So for example, clerics, merchants, and political leaders, and traditional women who opposed modern education were drawn with typically unflattering features and animalistic features, such as angry eyes, long nose, um, suggesting they were conceited, corrupt, uneducated, and generally untrustworthy. This is the Mujtahid of Ghazrin, mocked here for his polygamy. The hens are his uh, polygamous, um, many polygamous wives, for example. But progressive clerics, merchants, political leaders, and advocates of women's education were drawn with large transparent eyes and handsome features. In this way, despite its appropriation of the flawed conventions of physiognomy, the artist of Mullah Nasruddin differed from European cartoonists who applied physiognomy in the service of racist ideologies. Let me say just a couple of words about the end of the journal. Uh, Mullah Nasruddin lived through World War I, the 1917 Russian Revolution, the Russian Civil War, the birth and demise of the Azerbaijan Democratic Republic, 1918 to 20, and finally the establishment of the Soviet Union. <clears throat> As the authority of Joseph Stalin, who was also from Tiflis, grew more draconian <clears throat> in the late uh, 1920s, the fate of the contributors to the periodical was sealed. The Central Committee of the Azerbaijan Communist Party decided that the periodical would not be called Allah Sith, godless, and become the organ of the League of Atheists. And you can see it's at the very top. You can see that the name of the Mirza Jalil died of natural causes. You can say of a broken heart in 1932, January of 1932, very soon after the name change. Hamid Khanum lived on through great hardship, uh, but managed to write her memoir of their remarkable life, which, as I said, uh, Dr. Jawadi and Willem Floor have translated into English. And it's a beautiful book. Some of the writers of Mullah Nasruddin perished in the turbulent 1930s. Some remained quiet. Some became propagandists for the Stalinist regime just to survive. A few tried to protest and as a result faced brutal years or, or death in the labor camps of the Gulag. Among the people who were assassinated was Omar Foya, for example, the co-editor. And in fact, his name was eradicated almost. Uh, people couldn't refer to him as such an influential person on the journal um, until much, much, much later, really after the, almost after the fall of the Soviet Union. Now, um, let me say a couple of words about the everlasting legacy of Mullah Nasruddin. Mullah Nasruddin exposed the colonialist and imperialist policies of the great powers in Middle East, North Africa, India, and even those of the United States and Japan in East Asia. It called for greater dialogue and friendship between rival ethnic and religious communities. It reported on the major upheavals and achievements of the 1906 Iranian constitutional revolution 
and became a participant in the Tabriz civil war. <clears throat> it defied the Shi'i Muslim religious establishment in South Caucasus, Iran, and Najaf, and argued for a more progressive interpretation of Islam. It chastised the Bays and land-owning elites of the region and thus became a mouthpiece for the impoverished rural and urban classes. It encouraged the establishment of satirical journals and caricature among people of Iran, a tradition that was followed through the late 1970s, really something that only ended with the Islamic revolution in Iran. And finally, it initiated a radical discourse on gender reform and called attention to the plight of women and children. For all these accomplishments, Mullah Nasruddin for, will forever be considered a true literary gem of the early 20th century. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Afari, for this uh, very <clears throat> insightful talk and uh, warm congratulations again on your forthcoming book uh, with Dr. Kamran Afari. Is that correct? So awesome. we very I much look, look forward to that. Yes. So at this uh, stage, uh, I would like to invite Dr. Javadi also to join Dr. Afari for a conversation and a discussion. Dr. Javadi, you're... Um, um, are you ready to join us, please? Your, your microphone is muted, Dr. Zawadi. Um, uh, again, so yes, yes, wonderful. Is it okay? My voice yes. is all right. We can I hear you. So. Yes. Well, first of all, I should say that it was a wonderful and a very well balanced, very comprehensive. Uh, talk by Dr. Afari, uh, and uh, I really don't, uh, it is not very many things which are left that I should go on. Um, perhaps there are very few points that I, um, are left out in, in the sense that really in in one hour or so you can't say more than this and dr afari has um, provided us with a very well balanced very uh, appreciative kind of understanding of uh, Mullah Nasreddin. Uh, what i wanted to ask you, uh, actually a lot coming from you actually <laughs> And uh, actually, uh, I wanted to ask uh, Dr. Afari, per perhaps um, he she should have commented or compared uh, one of the very important and very similar uh, satirical periodical in Iran uh, with Mullah Nasratin, which is Charando Parand. Of course, the, Dr. Afari has translated that with uh, John Perry. Uh, and it is it's a very interesting point to make uh, because these two had correspondence with each other. And sometimes uh, the writer of um, Suresra field or Chand Paran. Uh, by the way, Chand Paran simply means uh, non nonsensical talk, or um, as they translated it, Chiriaveri. Is that right? Chariveri. Chariveri. And also, and interesting is that there, there is a, there was a, satirical uh, journal in Azerbaijan, which was called Tartan Partan, which is a, in fact a translation of the same, the same idea. And I should add that the similarity of the techniques and also the names of the satirical publications in Azerbaijan as well as Iran are very striking and very interesting to compare them from the point of view of subject matter and from the pure of the tirage 
how many are published and so on. So uh, I wondered actually if Dr. Afari perhaps uh, should have compared these two uh, somewhat because De Khoda, who was one of the most talented satirists of Iran, uh, was in correspondence with Jalil Mamakuri Zadeh and as well as Sabir, and they correspond retorted to each other. They one wrote something and he the other one answered him uh, in, in kind of dialogue in two different uh, publications. And the publications, of course, Mullah Nasraddin lasted for quite a long time, that is to say, from 1906 to 1932, with, with some lapses in between. Um, and whereas um, Suresh Rafi was almost about well, nearly two years, you can say. And because of the bombardment of the of the Majlis, um, the Khuda fled to um, Europe, and three issues were published in Iverden, uh, in Switzerland. And comparing them from the point of view, satirical point of view, are extremely interesting. Um, at one point, the Khuda wrote a satirical poem in. Uh, in Turkish, in Azerbaijani, you know, and, and send it to uh, to um, to Mullah Nasrattin. And one more point that I would uh, wanted uh, to mention is that the language is very important uh, in both Mullah Nasrattin and. And, um, and as well as to rest of it, because the, the event of constitutional revolution really changed the journalism or the language of journalism in Iran um, considerably. It was, one can say that it was the really beginning of modern literature or fiction, the development of fiction as we know it in, uh, in Iran. Because before, let me give you a little bit of the background and you can see how many publications were published at that short time. According to um, uh, Press and Poetry of Brown, from the beginning of publication of uh, newspapers in Iran, that is to say 1832, uh, 30, 1838 actually, until about beginning of 20th century, that is to say 1900, something like, um, uh, up to 1912, actually. That is from 1938 to 19, uh, 1838 until 1912, something like 371 publications were published, which 18 of them were um, not in Persian. Uh, in different languages. Out of this much, uh, uh, so many, 330, 332 were published between 1900, 1900 and 1912, which shows that the, how the effusion of the I mean, periodicals was incredibly vast. And the language changed in Persian as well, and also in Azerbaijani. Azerbaijani, Turkish, 
in Iran was not, was used, but not all that much. There's a famous story, perhaps um, I should mention this, that when Mirza Jalil came to Tabriz, uh, hoping that he will be um, under the protection of Khabani, but unfortunately Khabani was killed. And the first edition that he wanted to do, he, uh, they said that you have to write it in Farsi. He said, no, I want to write it in Azerbaijani. They said, you, you have to write it in Farsi. And then he said, how many Armenians are there in, in Tabriz? They said, I mean, the, the governor actually, Mokbar Sultan, he said, there are some 10,000 Armenians. And he said, okay, I will publish this in Armenian because Mr. Yeah. Jalil knew Armenian quite well. He said, okay, I will, how, he asked them, how many magazines or periodicals do, uh, this Armenian have in Tabriz? They are free to do, uh, to publish. They said two. He said, okay, I will publish. If 10,000 people are allowed to have two publications, the majority of people here are Turkish speaking speakers. So I will, instead of that, I will publish it, my, my magazine in Armenian. So they said, it was really embarrassing. So they said, okay, okay, publish it in, in, in Azerbaijani, but write the first article in Persian. Of course, he didn't do it. And the amazing was that the publication of the first issue of Mullah Nasatin in Tabriz, the first day, was published in 10,000 copies. And, and sorry, 1,000 copies, 1,000 copies, uh, the first one. And the first day, 600 of them were sold out. And, and of course, Mr. Jalil had written a very satirical, a very pungent piece at the beginning of the first page of the newspaper. So it was banned. So they said that they, uh, the governor sent some, some of the Farrash to get the uh, other copies of the um, magazine. And Hamide Khanom, who was this incredible woman who had hired to find Chi in, in order to protect her husband, uh, and he, she, she said, made a big fuss, said, what are you saying? We have sold everything. He, she gave only four copies of it to the Farrash and sent out 400 copies from the other door outside. I don't know how many, if I start talking about Mullah Nasset, then perhaps I will go on forever. Is there anything that? Thank you so much, Dr. Javadi. Uh, um, of course, we would also never get tired of honestly listening to you. I myself, you know how much I have error that to you. <laughs> At this point, perhaps we can ask, uh, uh, if you don't mind, Dr. Afari, if she has um, uh, any comments to make, uh, because we would also like to have some questions by the, um, the audience. Uh, there is one question. And of course, we'll get back to you, Dr. Javadi, at some point, uh, because I would love to uh, you to have some uh, uh, final remarks as well. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Afari, please. Thank you very much for those remarks. That is absolutely an excellent point, which is that, uh, do you happen to have any indication of the exchanges between uh, Ali Akbar de Khoda and Mirza Jalil, I mean, in terms of the, uh, the uh, is there, a, you know, because it would be 
wonderful. I mean, there's obviously a back and forth going between them in the pages of the newspaper. Um, but I don't know how much of that stuff has survived if there was personal correspondence between the two of them. I really don't know exactly, <laughs> but apart from the piece that you know I translated for your right. book, yes, which you uh, that did. one, yes. um, uh, yeah. um, she, I found out recently that he had quite a number of Turkish poems. Mm -hmm. And these were the poems that he occasionally wrote because he was from Kazvin. And you see, you know that Kazvinis are kind of bilingual. Yeah. And apparently this was some kind of correspondence between them, but I haven't found any, any letters or anything about uh, this and no, I don't really know <clears throat> that, that much between them. Yeah, so that was actually um, the other thing is that it would be wonderful if the plays of Mirza Jalil <clears throat> became yeah. available in English. Yeah, uh, in fact, recently, you know, that one of his plays was performed in Tabriz. Mm -hmm. And it was, some people were against it and they had actually a gun. He had taken a gun with himself, Mr. Jalil, in order to defend himself on the stage. Yeah. We had a question from the audience, which maybe I could answer. Um, uh, Dr. Ghulam Reza Vatandus, who was kind enough to stay up in Kuwait to listen to us today, he says hello to you, I, by the way, also, yeah. Dr. Javadi. He asks about um, Reza Shah coming to power and the reaction of Mullah Nasruddin. What we do know is that, uh, of course, uh, Mullah Nasruddin had always criticized Iranian leaders, uh, rulers, as well as clerics. And so it continues doing so. and. It gets into trouble because Reza Shah actually launches a formal complaint to the Soviet authorities. I think the date is about 1925-26. And he says they're, he's making, they're making fun of me in this journal. And he knows Mullah Nasruddin very well. Of course, every Iranian knew it. And would you stop it? And so he gets this um, basically statement from the Communist Party of Azerbaijan that he shouldn't be ridiculing the Reza Shah because of you know foreign relations between and he gets he gets very upset and other members of the duma get upset some of the other ones get upset and they said you know we thought if we had a revolution and we were in charge that we would actually be able to speak more freely and now you're actually making Mullah Nasruddin speak less freely than what he did before so that was really a big issue at the time yeah I may, I wanted to relate a um, personal story about <laughs> Mullah Nasruddin and how I became uh, interested uh, 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 with Mullah Nasruddin. As a child, I was say about 10, 11 or something like that. And I used to go to my uncle's house in Tabriz, which was, um, it was actually the Armenian quarter of Tabriz. Um, and they used to have um, a sitting room and there was a canapé, a kind of uh, sofa. sofa. But the sofa was very interestingly designed. That is to say, inside it was empty. So when you, you open the sitting uh, the part of it, there was a kind of a box inside. And two volumes of Mullah Nasruddin was hidden there. And I got to know this. Um, I actually, later on, I acquired them, these Mullah Nasratin issues, 
let me perhaps I can show you. This is the original copy. Oh, wow. This is the one you found in this inside the sofa? Yeah, this was the inside that. And one complete set of um, Mazali, mm -hmm. 15 yes. of them, which is absolutely this bound in another volume, two. And I was very curious because I could read it in, in Turkish. Um, my Farsi was not all that great at that time. And, um, but um, it, they hid this, these two volumes, because it was <clears throat> thought that after Pishavari and so on, this mm -hmm. is um, no, no. You see, it was later on. So many years later, I came back, I came to America and I got interested in reading Mullah Nasreddin and all sorts of things. I wrote a paper about Sabir and so on. I I had read. I knew that. And in 1990, I went back to Iran and I bought this from my uh, uncle for $200 and a camera. Okay, good deal. So I still have it, and it's very interesting that I, from that time, I remember that, and especially the um, stories and so on. That's a nice story. That is a great story. Yeah, a lifelong passion. Yeah. So I, since we're doing show and tell, this is Shana uh, <laughs> Dutaran. <laughs> English. So this is the work that Dr. Jawadi was referring to. It's a, a translation in English, which we did with John Perry um, of all the Charandaparan columns of the journal called Surya Strafil. And if you read this and uh, you, you read some of the stories of, by Mirza Jalil, you really see Did how you. much there was this exchange going on. I mean, it becomes clear as day basically yeah you know that although the Khoda is an original and you know when you do something in a different language uh, even if you're inspired by another culture or your Azerbaijani mother tongue it's still something original so he originated uh, sort of modern Persian literature uh, but he had he was inspired very much by Mirza Jalil and by Mullah Nasruddin and there's just really no doubt about that. So we owe a lot, a good debt of gratitude, I, I wanna say to the Azerbaijani speaking people of Iran, because they have been really the transmitter of so many remarks, and also the Armenians of Iran, that also, yeah. they have been the transmitters of so much important thing, and so many important things, arts and literature, satire, cartoon, uh, in this case, short story, fiction, uh, because of their relationship to their co-religionists inside the Caucasus, who were, um, you know, were going to school and were familiar with the Russian literature and European literature, and they became these people who knew both languages, they became the transmitters of, it's not just a question of transmitting, because it's recreating, essentially, you, you take some ideas and then you try to recreate it for another location in another language. And so that connection to me, um, that was a, everybody who asks, you know, why was the constitutional revolution so progressive? And I think that was the reason. The reason was that the connection to the Caucasus, the connection to Armenian social democrats, Georgians, particularly the Azerbaijanis, I would say, particularly yeah. because of who brought this. And you see that in the 1920s also with Khiyabani. You see that in the 40s uh, again. Uh, a whole generation of the Iranian Communist Party, regardless of what their foreign policy was, what they did inside Iran, the translations they did, the publications they produced, um, that all was also a generation. The Azerbaijanis and the Armenians also again played a huge role. And then the connection gets severed, you know, after World War II, there's not easy to go back and forth anymore. Um, and we kind of lose that. We almost lose that connection, that very important connection, I think, in Iran. Yeah, that's true. Yes. Uh, yeah, I should add that um, 
Turkish actually, Azerbaijani, that is to say, was very prevalent and very almost, you can say, the court language of the Safavi period. Uh, I, I am, we published a, a dictionary of Turkish, four type of dictionary, uh, five types of dictionary uh, Turkish, which was um, common at that time. Of course, it is, uh, first one is Çağatayi, and then is Rumi to Persian, which is the modern Istanbul Turkish. Then is Kızılbaşi, which is Azari. At that time, it was called Kızılbaşi. And then um, we have Russian Turkish, Rusiye, Turkey Rusi, which is Tatar Kreme Tatars, which Mr. Putin has destroyed them. Okay. Uh, and, and then Kalmuk, which is some kind of very close to um, Mongolian. And this was written by Nasiri and his son in the time of Shah, Sul Shah Suleiman, I think. And it is amazing that at that time it was very popular uh, Turkish. At one point time, uh, there was a um, traveler, uh, one of the travelers who had come from Italy and he knew only Turkish um, and um, to the court of Shah Abbas. And Shah Abbas became the translator for him because he knew Turkish and he knew Georgian, some Georgian, the Shah Abbas. And he was translating this guy for this guy and his courtier, uh, courtiers. It was so common. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, very nice. Nice story. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Zawadi and Dr. Afari, uh, both for the uh, very informative and insightful talk and also for the fascinating discussion that uh, you had together. Um, um, I also am very grateful to the audiences who have uh, joined us today. Uh, we have come to sort of the end of, um, uh, of the time, but of course, I'll again get back to you for final remarks. I would like to um, very quickly remind, of, of course, if there is any questions at this point, um, you know, if the speaker and the discussant are kind enough to answer them, uh, we'll definitely welcome them while I'm talking, uh, while I'm uh, mentioning these points. Um, I just wanted to say that after um, the event uh, ends, or actually before it, before <laughs> right before it ends, there will be a survey posted by uh, Connie. Uh, we normally take that, uh, give that survey, and would be grateful if you uh, could fill it out. It might take you, you know, a few minutes to complete it, but it's very helpful to us in terms of uh, further improvement in the future. Um, and also, please uh, remember to join us uh, on March, uh, not March, sorry, <laughs> today is March 5th, but our next event, uh, as far as I remember, it's sometime in April, but because I don't have it here, I don't want to misinform you, but I know all the other information. So it's going to be sometime in April, as far as I remember, but you can Google UBC plus Ahmad Yan, and then you'll quickly get the list of our talks. Our next talk is the Persian prison poem from South Asia to the Caucasus towards an anthology. And then we'll have three, two speakers and one uh, discussant, uh, Rebecca Gold, professor and uh, professorial research fellow, Islamic world and comparative literature from University of Birmingham and Kayvana Tahmasibian, PhD research associate, uh, Global Lit University of Birmingham. Those are the speakers. And of course the discussant will be Dr. Samuel Hodgkin, Assistant Professor of Comparative Literature from Yale University. Um, otherwise, I would like again to ask uh, Dr. Afari and Dr. Um, Javadi if they have any final remarks to mention before we say goodbye to our lovely audience this evening. Thank you very Thank you. much, Dr. Abedi Fahd. It was a wonderful session. I it's really, been a pleasure. I really yeah. enjoyed listening to Dr. Javadi's comments and uh, some comments we had afterwards. Thanks for Thank everyone so for organizing. Thank you so much. As well.
It's been our honor and pleasure to have you both. Dr. Javadi, please. Well, uh, it was uh, my pleasure really to listen to you all. And uh, I, just I missed the, the title of your um, forthcoming lecture. What was it called? Oh, our lecture or uh, um, the, the Ahmadiyan lecture. The next one is about uh, prison poems. Oh, prison uh, yes. poem. Oh, ha Habsiyat in uh, prison yes. poetry. Exactly. Now, exactly. now, man has his order now. Exactly. <laughs> Mas'ud Asad is definitely going to be among them, but uh, a lot of others as well, I'm sure. Uh, so yeah, that's the, that's the, but uh, the title of, I thought you were going to uh, ask about title of Dr. Afari's book, because I forgot that title. Uh, Dr. Afari, do you mind reminding us of the title of the book, which I cannot wait to actually hold in my hands when it's published, of course. <laughs> it's called Molana Sudin, The Making of a Modern Trickster. And Making of a Modern Trickster. Trickster. Wonderful. And I can uh, see that it comes after a few articles that you uh, and or Dr. Kamran Afar Afari already published. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you so much again, everyone. Thank you, uh, uh, all of the audiences for joining us. And Nazgul and Kani, thank you for your incredible help. Um, you all have a a uh, great rest of your uh, day and or or night wherever you're located thank you so much